Bien, vamos a, vamos a, a dar comienzo a la sesión eh, vespertina. Eh, lo vamos a hacer con, con Sir John Layton, eh, que tiene una doble formación en Bellas Artes y en Historia del Arte, que fue profesor de la Universidad de Edimburgo hasta que se unió a la National Gallery en 1986 de Londres como conservador de la pintura del siglo XIX, que de hecho es su mayor eh, especialidad ¿no? y donde hizo exposiciones pues, tan importantes como de la Caspar David eh, Friedrich o eh, Art in the Making Impressionism. Eh, ha sido director del Museo Van Gogh en Ámsterdam desde 1997 al año eh, 2006, cuando asumió la dirección de la National Gallery de Scotland y nos va a hablar hoy sobre arte para Escocia, inspiración para el mundo, el futuro de las National Galleries of Scotland. John. So, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, a few thank yous. Miguel, thank you for the introduction. And congratulations on the bicentenary of this wonderful museum. Thank you also to the friends, the wonderful friends of the Prado Museum for organizing uh, this uh, couple of days of uh, conferences and talks. Uh, and perhaps a special thank you to the translator Amania, who is going to take my very mediocre English and translate it into wonderfully eloquent, fluent Spanish for you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. So, we are going to go north, quite a bit north, to Scotland, home of whiskey, <laughs> golf, tartan, haggis, and all sorts of wonderful stuff like that. It's quite a bit cooler in Scotland than it is in Madrid, but we are just as warm and passionate about our art and culture. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always something of a challenge to know how I might sum up the National Galleries of Scotland in just a few sentences. So perhaps I would describe our National Galleries as a relatively small but very high quality collection of European and Scottish art. That collection begins somewhere in the medieval period and continues right the way through to the present day. We have a gallery devoted to contemporary art. And we show our collection, for the most part, in various sites across the city of Edinburgh. And there are some of our buildings on the screen. Here we have, oh, sorry. Here we have our National Gallery, our National Portrait Gallery, and the two buildings set in a beautiful sculpture park which make up our gallery of modern art. This is a view of the Scottish National Gallery, two very beautiful neoclassical buildings linked together by a set of underground spaces. You might describe this as our flagship gallery. Uh, it is the home of our old master collection and probably the best known part of our organization. Behind the gallery sits Edinburgh's famous castle on a huge chunk of rock. That ancient rock is the remains of an extinct volcano. It last erupted some 42 million years ago, so I think we're probably quite safe. To the left here, you just catch a little glimpse of the medieval city. And to the right here, what we call the new town, which was actually built in the 18th century. And what this photograph shows 
is that the National Gallery in Scotland sits at the very heart of the capital city, physically and symbolically. The setting, the architecture, they suggest timelessness, continuity, a continuity between past, present, and future. All sounds quite simple, but is it? Like all museums, our National Galleries of Scotland, it's an institution that was conceived as something that would last across the ages, that would endure across many, many generations. Yet, as you all know, we now live in a time of unprecedented change. There are dramatic changes underway, changes in politics, in patterns of society, in the way that we live, the way we organize ourselves, the way that we communicate with one another. And in common with many of the museums that you've heard about today and yesterday, we too in Scotland, we have to respond to those changes, to the challenges, to the opportunities that they bring. And I've used the title of this talk, uh, Art for Scotland, Inspiration for the World, because I want to talk in particular about how we position ourselves as a Scottish institution, but with an international outlook. Now that sounds perhaps easy or simple in theory, but in practice, as I'd like to show you, it does require some quite delicate balances and occasionally some difficult choices. And perhaps along the way, I can give you some sense of the character of our institution and how we've been rethinking our sense of purpose in a very unpredictable, a very volatile setting. Now, I began my career in museums <laughs> over, well, let's say 30 years ago. Uh, as a junior curator, as Miguel said, a junior curator in a very different National Gallery, the National Gallery in London. That's me on the screen, leaning against one of those pillars at the front of the building, looking very self-confident. <laughs> I had a lot more hair, but very little experience. <laughs> These days, it's the other way around. <laughs> Back then, in the 1980s, the world of museums, well, it seemed very different. At the National Gallery, uh, the atmosphere was rather gentle, academic, scholarly. There was perhaps a sense that not very much had changed over the years, and not very much was about to change uh, in the decades to come. I remember uh, not long after I started at the National Gallery, uh, there was a survey in a newspaper which, uh, which worked out which are the most and which are the least stressful professions? And a museum curator was apparently the least stressful <laughs> occupation, uh, beaten only by being a librarian in a provincial library. <laughs> it doesn't quite feel like that now. Again, on my first day at the National Gallery, I was shown into uh, an office, and there in that office, there was a very elegant chaise longue, a reclining sofa. <laughs> and I said, what's that for? That was where your predecessor used to have a siesta <laughs> when he got back from lunch at his club. 
Now, Gabriele Finaldi will forgive me for a bit of exaggeration, but that was the atmosphere then. And of course, as you'll have heard today, it's very different now. And it's certainly very different also at the National Galleries of Scotland. If we fast forward to today, that atmosphere is, as I say, quite changed. One very obvious change, which you've heard a lot about over the last couple of days, is the levels of interest and the numbers of visitors that come through the doors, the doors of all national museums, and uh, our gallery is no exception to that. At the National Galleries of Scotland, our visitor numbers have doubled over the last 10 years. I just show you, this is perhaps just a little bit of fun, but um, I couldn't resist showing this is a little painting of the interior of the National Gallery of Scotland in about 1860, uh, a year or two after the gallery opened. And you might just be able to see how serene and peaceful it looks. Um, there's a, a very well-dressed guard reading a book, uh, and there are two ladies making copies of the paintings, and you probably can just see a, a man there with a very handsome Scottish hat making a copy of another picture. You wouldn't see that scene today, of course, and like uh, many other museums, we will have queues outside the doors, we will have crowds bustling in front of the most famous works. Last year, we welcomed 2.7 million visitors to our galleries, 2.7 million. And if you think that Edinburgh is a city with just half a million residents, that gives you some idea of the scale. Audiences have grown, but so too have the expectations of what we offer to visitors of all ages. Of course, it's absolutely us usual for all kinds of museums to offer education programs, and that's something that's been going on for many years. And scenes like the one on the, the left there of the children enjoying some creativity that you can see all over the world. But it is becoming more common for us to be involved in other needs, other demands. I take, for example, the area of health. There is increasing recognition of the benefits of participation in art and culture and how this can improve well-being. We now even have some doctors prescribing visits to our art gallery as part of the treatment of certain diseases and conditions. Here on the screen near me, this is what, uh, a glimpse of one of the programs that we offer for people suffering from dementia. We also have programs for the partially sighted, for people recovering from strokes, from heart disease, from mental health problems. This, I would predict, is an area which will only increase in demand as the years go by, as especially with an aging population. And of course, over the last few days, you've heard a lot about how technology and the digital revolution, how that's been transforming the way that we live, the way that we act, the way that we communicate. And we now have amazing opportunities to share our collections across the world. As this image on the far left shows, there are also some issues that go along with that. You can see perhaps that those children are sitting in front of one of the most famous paintings in the world, Rembrandt's The Night Watch. And what are they doing? They're looking at their phones. Let's hope they're looking for information about the painting <laughs> and not playing Candy Crush. <laughs> of course, it is really the opportunities with digital that we think about. Changes in communication and social media that have really brought about a different kind of relationship with our audiences. 
I think in the past, there was a tendency for museums to relate to their publics from a kind of position of authority, from a certain distance, as if it was from high to low. Social media, digital, has helped to change all that. People, our audiences, our public expect a different kind of relationship. They expect to be able to participate, to influence, even to co-create with curators in ways which really would have been unimaginable even 10 years ago. Here's another trend, how we relate to more directly to issues in politics and questions that animate contemporary life. You'll find that it is increasingly common for museums to become almost a focal point for debate or even the site of direct protest. Here's a few examples on the screen at the top left there, climate change protesters uh, scaling the columns of the British Museum in a very daring way. Uh, a similar act in the Louvre. Here, a different kind of protest at the Whitney Museum. Protesters, including staff of the museum, protesting against the, uh, ac uh, the, the one of their own trustees who's involved in the arms industry. And here in Edinburgh, in Scotland, we have people protesting against uh, our museum being sponsored by an oil company, BP. In the past, there was perhaps a tendency to see museums as places almost removed from the everyday, somewhere where the concerns, the tensions, the conflicts of society um, didn't, uh, Im didn't impose themselves, a place of sanctuary, if you like. Now I think museums are much more likely to be seen as dynamic social spaces and as emblems of cultural and symbolic significance, it's really not surprising that we should be pulled into controversy, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly. Yesterday, I heard of a, uh, quite an interesting example of a museum dealing with this. Uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the V&A. Maybe you remember that uh, a few months ago in May, a group called Extinction Rebellion occupied several bridges in London, blocking the roads and creating quite a lot of uh, chaos. Uh, I heard yesterday that the V&A Museum has now actually acquired some of their banners and their artwork for their collection. That's an interesting engagement with contemporary life. So all these factors, new technology, in, increasing audiences, increasing polarization and politicization, all of these are, are driving transformation and creating possibilities and challenges for us in our world of museums. And in the setting of Scotland, the political and social context, well, that's also changed very dramatically in the last 10 years and it remains especially unpredictable. As I'm sure you will know, politics in the United Kingdom is, what shall we say, <laughs> fluid. <laughs> it's certainly divided at the moment as we go through the very painful process of Brexit. In Scotland, the historical ties with the European mainland, we call it the European mainland, you see, we live on an island. In, in Scotland, the ties with Europe, they've always been very strong, strengthened through trade, through migration, through political allegiances across the centuries. And quite a large majority of the population in Scotland would prefer to remain in the European Union. So the prospect of Brexit, the prospect of leaving the EU, 
that has reignited debates about the independence of Scotland and whether it should break away from the United Kingdom. That was an issue which was supposed to have been settled for a generation uh, through a referendum back in 2014, but which now, because of Brexit, is again very firmly on the agenda. And there on the screen, you'll see the two different sides, yes to uh, leave the United Kingdom, and no, uh, both equally vociferous. The world of culture, the world of art, can't escape from these debates. At the National Galleries, uh, we have thought very hard about issues of national identity. Uh, what does it mean for us to be a national institution in Scotland today? We live in a country where issues of identity are contested, they are controversial. Do we just ignore this? Or do we reflect it in our collection, our programs, our activities? And how do we navigate through some of this volatility that I have been describing? Well, in a moment, uh, I will tell you a little bit more about how we have been changing our position changing our profile. But before I do that, perhaps a little bit of a background, a little bit of context might be a helpful setting. If I begin by looking back, you find that debates and discussions about identity and national representation They've actually always been part of our history at the National Galleries of Scotland. I mentioned at the beginning that we are a collection of art with a wider European and international dimension, but we also look after the national collection of Scottish art. And the balance between the two, between art from the rest of the world and art from Scotland, has always carried with it some kind of political dimension in our institution. There's always been a debate about whether the National Gallery is about art for Scotland and promoting and cultivating local and national Scottish art, or whether we should have a more international outlook, a more international ambition. Our collection, uh, although we, today we are a, a very public art gallery, our collection actually had its origins in the teaching of art and artists. In the early 19th century, there were very few opportunities for artists in Scotland to see works from uh, the great old masters. So the collection was first established as part of an academy of art to provide examples, examples of great old masters that would inspire local artists and encourage their ambition and so that they could learn through copying. And it was really taken for granted in the beginning that those artists would need to have access to the very best Italian, the very best French, the very best Spanish masters. When the gallery first opened in 1859, the collection was extremely modest, very small, a sort of medley of bits and pieces borrowed from local collections. Unfortunately, we didn't have a great royal collection to uh, give us a start. Our royal family held on to their heads and uh, held on to their collections. So we had to create the from scratch. Uh, half of the building was given over to exhibitions of the Scottish Academy and the other half to this collection of bits and bobs. On the screen, I show you two of the best works which were on show when the gallery first opened. On the left, a very beautiful uh, work by the Venetian artist, Jacopo Bassano, of the Adoration of the Magi. Uh, and on the right, uh, by the Scottish artist, Alan Ramsey, a portrait of the great Enlightenment philosopher, David Hume. <laughs> David Hume, whose 
whose face seems quite literally to come emerge from the darkness as a symbol of enlightenment. In the early days, the local and the international were kind of mixed together and displayed with equal prominence. But during the course of the 19th century, the extent of the Scottish collections and in relation to what was described as foreign art, uh, the Scottish collections, that became more of an issue. Nationalism as a political movement was gaining ground in Scotland. And at the same time, Scottish artists were attracting more success and there was increasing pressure for the National Gallery to represent them, to give a stronger representation of historic and modern Scottish art. So gradually, art from Scotland became the main focus of the gallery. Here on the screen, two very fine examples. On the left-hand side, uh, Sir Henry Rayburn's magnificent life-size portrait of a Highland chieftain, Colonel Alastair MacDonald of Glengarry, uh, painted around 1815, at a time when even then it would have been ridiculous for somebody to walk around like this, but it's, of course, a very romantic view of a Highland chief. On the right-hand side, uh, a rather beautiful evocation of the Scottish Highlands by an artist called Peter Graham, and it's called Wandering Shadows. The decision to collect mainly Scottish art, of course, wasn't just driven by cultural politics. It was driven by uh, practical concerns. There was no money. Uh, and uh, in 1907, the gallery's curator noted that the prices for old master paintings, European old master paintings, meant that the National Gallery should abandon any hope of possessing great European masters and just focus instead on the cheaper homegrown stuff. Towards the end of the 19th century, the creation of a separate uh, Scottish National Portrait Gallery that added further momentum to discussions about art and national identity. Now, it seems to be a particularly British preoccupation to create portrait galleries, uh, galleries dedicated to portraits of men and women of achievement. In the 19th century and early 20th century, portrait galleries were opened in London, in Dublin, in Edinburgh, and in countries of British influence, Canada, the United States, and Australia. And the idea, which has its origins in uh, Victorian ideas of morality from people like Thomas Carlyle, the idea was quite simple, <coughs> that the public should be presented with examples of great achievement, and this in turn would inspire them to better themselves, to raise their ambition. In Edinburgh, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, which opened in 1890, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery became a focal point for national pride and identity, a place in which Scottish heroes and heroines from the past could be celebrated through portraiture. That's the exterior of the building on the left-hand side, unusually for Edinburgh in a sort of northern Gothic style, most of the 19th century and 18th century buildings in Edinburgh in a Grecian neoclassical style. It's sometimes called the Athens of the North. So here you have this Gothic uh, mixture of styles, richly decorated with sculptures along the outside of great heroes, Robert the Bruce, Mary Queen of Scots, and so on. And in the interior also, murals depicting glorious moments from Scottish history, mainly victories over the English, rather few and far between, it has to be said. Um, and there's a view of the Great Hall in the Portrait Gallery on the right-hand side, and you can probably just make out a, a statue of our national poet, Robert Burns. So by the end of the 19th century, you had two national galleries in Edinburgh, both with a very strong and distinctive Scottish character. In the following century, the 20th century, 
that all began, began to change and the pendulum swung the other way towards a rather different vision and approach. There were several reasons for this. One was funding. For the first time in the early 20th century, the gallery started to receive a grant from government to purchase pictures. And that was followed in the 1920s and 1930s by a number of generous financial gifts that allowed some pretty major purchases of European art to be made. Just a couple of examples on the uh, screen. On the left-hand side, if you were here this morning, you would have heard Laurence Descartes show uh, uh, an image of a painting by Emile Bernard from 1888 of Breton women in a prairie. Uh, and she mentioned this painting by Paul Gauguin uh, called Vision After the Sermon, um, which was really a, a seminal, a key work in the development of his less naturalistic style as the Breton women come out of church and imagine the sermon that they've just heard in the church, Jacob wrestling with an angel. On the right-hand side, so that Gauguin was purchased in the 1920s, and the painting on the right-hand side is by the French 18th century artist Chardin. And it is, as far as I know, his only flower painting again purchased with uh, government money in the 1920s. So the collection began to uh, grow, but then after the Second World War, there came something that completely changed the status of the collection. And that was the loan from the Duke of Bridgewater of some of the most famous paintings in the world-renowned Bridgewater Collection. The Bridgewater Collection was formed by the first Duke of Bridgewater at the end of the 18th century. He was a very wealthy man, and he was able to purchase works that were being sold by, uh, during the French Revolution in London, most notably from the Orléans Collection, and uh, he purchased many, many major masterpieces. They were put on display for much of the 19th century and early 20th century in Bridgewater House in London, uh, a massive uh, and hugely important collection. But then during the war, Bridgewater House was bombed and partially destroyed, and the then Duke, returned from being a prisoner of war in Germany, he returned and moved his base to Scotland. Unfortunately, his uh, house in Scotland was rather smaller than Bridgewater uh, House in London, so he offered his collection on loan to the National Gallery of Scotland. And in 1945, uh, this group of paintings came to uh, the gallery in, in Edinburgh a relatively small group, some 30 pictures, but they include major works by Raphael, a set of seven sacraments by Poussin, self-portrait by Rembrandt, major works by Titian, including these two well-known paintings on the screen, uh, Titian's Diana and Actaeon on the far side and Diana and Callisto uh, on the screen near me, both painted for Philip II, in the 1550s, and part of a, a series which you will know well, for your own Venus and Adonis here in the Prado is part of it. Um, those paintings from the Bridgewater Collection still remain on loan to us. Um, these two we managed to purchase a couple of years ago, together with the National Gallery in, in London. But as I say, many others still stay as part of that loan but it would be hard to exaggerate the difference that this made to the status of the Old Master Collection. There were other factors at play as the 20th century progressed. Uh, in the aftermath of the war, it was felt to be important for Britain and for Scotland to build cultural bridges, to re-establish international connections. 
And one result of that policy was the founding of the Edinburgh Festival, which began in 1947. It's now the largest arts festival anywhere in the world. Many hundreds of thousands of visitors flood into the city every year to enjoy an absolutely bewildering array of performances across all the arts. If you've never been, I can re recommend it as an experience. Every space in the city, it seems, is turned into a venue, whether it's a cafe, a bar, a theater, a school, a telephone box. They all become venues for the arts. And from the 1940s onwards, that sense of internationalism, that sense that we needed to build bridges, that was also reflected in our collections. And against that background, it would have seemed to, it would have seemed parochial or inward looking to uh, focus and concentrate on the National School of Scottish Art. So gradually, the importance of our Scottish collections slipped away, diminished. Um, and that became especially apparent when the National Gallery was refurbished in grand style in the 1980s. There at the top of the screen, you can see how the main floor galleries were hung in a sort of country house style against these very rich uh, silk colorings of reds and greens. Uh, plenty of space, lots of daylight. And that was the, if you like, the European school. The Scottish collections were delegated, relegated to the basement. And that's them underneath in a uh, gloomy, airless, uh, dead-end space, um, which was reached by a very small proportion of our visitors. So gradually, the collections became known for their fantastic old masters. And the Scottish art was more or less invisible and certainly very poorly displayed. The portrait gallery, which I mentioned earlier, that was run down, almost derelict. Fewer than half of the rooms were open to the public. And meanwhile, the politics around the galleries were shifting. In 2007, Scotland elected its first Scottish nationalist government. And there was a growing sense that we at the National Galleries, we were out of tune with the prevailing mood across the country. So there was something of a challenge. How do we find a better balance between a Scottish identity and our international outlook? How do we give more prominence to national traditions without becoming overtly political or inward looking? Well, we started with a complete overhaul of our National Portrait Gallery. Physically, the building itself was uh, completely restored and refurbished. Uh, I'm showing you there uh, something of a, a before and after. On the left-hand side, one of the large galleries before, uh, you can see what a mess it is. And here, after the uh, refurbishment. Um, so the entire building was uh, reconfigured for 21st century audiences. The collections were reimagined and redisplayed. Um, there were, of course, uh, many historical displays featuring significant figures from history in Scotland, using portraits to tell stories about Scotland's past. Here, well, perhaps we should have a test how many of these you can recognize. Um, on the left, Mary, Queen of Scots. The top right, Bonnie, Prince Charlie. And on the bottom right, Robert Burns. All of them you would expect to find in a Scottish National Portrait Gallery. But we also, we also created what we call a portrait of a nation celebrating all aspects of contemporary life in Scotland. So that could involve what you might describe as modern heroes. 
Here on the left, a portrait by a Scottish artist of three very prominent cancer specialists working in the University of Dundee. Three men working at the very forefront of medical research. Or the images could be of the most non-heroic of people. Here on the right near me, uh, an image of some young boys, anonymous boys, on a Glasgow housing estate from the 1960s. All of this, I think, helps to bring the portrait gallery to life for visitors, to give it a sense of contemporary relevance, a place where you might encounter famous Scots, but also ordinary people in everyday settings. But whatever we did, we were always working to show that there isn't a simple, single idea of national identity, but that identity can be complicated, complex, multi-layered, and of course, highly personal. That renovation of the portrait gallery helped to rebalance the Scottish identity, in a sense to almost literally give the collection back to the people. But we continue that effort with our historic collections here at the National Gallery in the city centre. Uh, I showed you uh, a moment ago those rather gloomy basement spaces that used to be the home of the historic Scottish collections. Those are now closed, and we're currently in the middle of a major building project to create new and attractive galleries for this part of the collection. On the screen there are two um, uh, images of uh, uh, evoking what that will look like in a few years' time. Instead of uh, dark, airless spaces, light uh, and uh, daylight uh, uh, galleries, to give that collection room to breathe. Here's, a, here's another image, also with views out ac across the city. We will, of course, continue to give prominence to the old master traditions, but we're also going to give equal prominence to the story of art in Scotland and how that emerged as a distinct school in its own right in the 17th century and to become quite a strong tradition in the 18th, 19th, and 20th. So if in the past, the pendulum swung between being either Scottish or international, now we are trying to find the right balance between the two. And along the way, we have some great stories to tell and some great works to show. On the far left, uh, a portrait by the 18th century Scottish artist, Alan Ramsay, which I think bears comparison to any of the best 18th century portraits anywhere in Europe. It's a portrait of his second wife, Margaret. After the death of his first wife, uh, Ramsay uh, fell in love with uh, the young daughter of a Scottish lord who didn't take very kindly to his daughter uh, uh, consorting with an artist. So the couple had to elope. They ran away. And this portrait was painted shortly after they arrived in London and after the birth of their first daughter. And it's a, it's a wonderfully tender, intimate portrait. On the right-hand side, one of the more famous images from our Scottish collections by Henry Rayburn, popularly known as the skating minister. Uh, hard to say why this image of a Scottish uh, religious minister is so compelling. Um, perhaps it's because we expect a portrait of a religious figure to be a bit more serious, a bit more formal. There's the minister with his distinctive silhouette skating across a frozen Edinburgh loch there's something rather beautifully serene and also something faintly amusing about this uh, picture with the minister and his intelligent features and that faraway gaze. In presenting our collections, uh, we don't shy away from some of the complexities that underlie our history and how they might be viewed by contemporary audiences. 
I'm going to give you one example. This is a painting called The Monarch of the Glen by the 19th century artist Edwin Landseer. Um, it's arguably one of the most famous images associated with Scotland. And for much of its history, the painting was owned by various whiskey companies. Uh, and the painting has been used to promote and sell Scotch whiskey all across the world. If you're fond of whiskey, you might recognize this particular brand, uh, who were at one time owners of the painting. Uh, it then belonged more recently to the global drinks giant called Diageo, uh, owners of everything from Guinness to goodness knows what. Um, a few years ago, the company Diageo decided that the Monarch of the Glen no longer fitted with the company brand, and uh, they put it up for sale. And at the National Galleries, we were determined to buy it, uh, which we managed to do after a, a fundraising campaign. And so the picture now hangs in a prominent place in the Scottish National Gallery. Um, and as you can see, all, children have all sorts of wonderful, amusing times uh, putting on their antlers. But for many of our visitors, you would think, you would think that this painting of a Highland stag is quite an innocent thing, but it is actually quite ambiguous. For visitors from abroad, for tourists, it's something of a romantic image of the Scottish Highlands. A proud stag set against a mountainous backdrop, exactly the sort of image that attracts so many people to the Scottish countryside. For people living for many people living in Scotland, however, it's an image with a whole range of different associations. The artist, Edwin Landseer, was not Scottish, but he was English. And this painting was actually made for the House of Lords in London. Landseer was Queen Victoria's favorite painter. And for some people, this image is, it's not only proto-Disney, it's not only terribly sentimental, uh, but it actually represents the world of huge country estates which dominate the Scottish landscape, many of them owned by English aristocrats or wealthy foreigners who exploit the countryside for their own enjoyment and enrichment. Land ownership, hunting, the exploitation of land, these are hugely controversial issues in Scotland. So you find that even an innocent, seemingly innocent picture offers all kinds of layers of interpretation. And so we don't, as I say, shy away from that, but we allow it to become a focus of debate. In thinking about our identity as a national art gallery in Scotland, we haven't just focused on a capital city, on uh, Edinburgh. We know that for many people, art galleries are actually quite intimidating places. In Edinburgh, our buildings are rather grand. They're built in an, uh, to almost to evoke temples of art. You have to climb up the steps and through the pillars. Uh, we also know that the majority of our audiences are educated, middle-class city dwellers, people who are familiar with participating in all kinds of culture. So if we want to reach a wider audience, and in particular, a wider audience from across our own country, then we have to do things rather differently. So that's why a few years ago, we came up with the concept of what we started to call a gallery without walls. The galleries in Edinburgh would still be a base for our activities. But rather than waiting for people to come to us, we would take the art out to them, out into society and out into the wider world. So we began a very extensive program of sharing our collection through partnership, through loans, and touring exhibitions. 
A central part of that collection, of that program, is one that we operate together with the Tate in London. Back in 2008, the National Galleries of Scotland and Tate in London, we acquired together a large collection of modern and contemporary art. It was from the, uh, the collector and dealer, Anthony Doffe. The collection consists of some 1,500 works by 30 artists, and it ranges from Andy Warhol and Joseph Boyce through to Damien Hirst, Jeff Koons, Louise Bourgeois, Alex Katz, who you saw this morning. Now, how the two museums, Tate and National Galleries, own together and manage and operate such a large question, that in itself is a story for another time. Um, but it is a collection which is specifically designed to tour, to travel across the United Kingdom and to bring modern and contemporary art to places where the public, the public wouldn't normally expect to encounter it. Uh, all the exhibitions are devoted to one single artist, and so the program is called Artist Rooms. And it is one of the most extensive and I think innovative touring programs anywhere in Europe. And in the last 10 years, we've held some 185 exhibitions from this collection at 82 different locations, and it's reached some 51 million visitors across the United Kingdom, bringing, as I say, world-class art to smaller towns and sometimes very remote settings. <clears throat> the reception that you receive in some of these communities is usually amazing, and there are always education programs, and it's always aimed generally at younger audiences. Uh, here on the screen, on the left-hand side, those are children in the small town of Perth in Scotland, all dressing up as Andy Warhol. And on the right-hand side, uh, these are children in a small town near Glasgow called Kilmarnock. Now, you've probably never heard of Kilmarnock. Uh, it's, uh, there's no reason for you to go there. Uh, it was, in the 19th century and the 20th century, an important center for manufacturing and industry. It's probably most famous as being the home of Johnny Walker whiskey at one stage. You think I'm employed by the Scotch Whiskey Association? I'm not. Uh, manufacturing has left Kilmarnock. Johnny Walker left Kilmarnock in 2012. The last bottling plant left in 2012. There's literally not much in this town. And so when you go there with an exhibition of perhaps the most famous living German artist, Gerhard Richter, you're assured of uh, that you will make some um, noise. And there, indeed, you can see that the kids are enjoying themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, back in the 19th century, our galleries were founded with a very strong sense of purpose, a uh, strong sense of vision. There was felt to be an urgent need for the public to have access to great works of art and to provide education and inspiration to encourage ambition. And I think today all museums need to keep and maintain a similar strong sense of purpose. For us in Scotland, that has meant changing from something of a passive to an active engagement with our public. It has meant reconnecting with our distinctive national identity, but without losing a much wider view. It has involved rethinking our buildings, our architecture, our program, our displays, and perhaps encouraging sharing our collection more widely across the country to encourage a greater sense of ownership, participation, and involvement. Sometimes that has taken us with some interesting experiments. Last year, we put that painting by Landseer, the Monarch of the Glen, we put it in the back of a specially adapted lorry, and we took it to primary schools across Scotland. The children could come onto the lorry and see the painting in their own school playground and uh, enjoy it for a couple of hours. Uh, they did. 
I cannot predict what the future will bring for Scotland as a, nature, as, a, as a nation. Perhaps Scotland will remain part of the United Kingdom, where, and perhaps the Union Jack will continue to fly above the Scottish National Gallery alongside the Scottish Saltire, the Scottish flag. Perhaps Scotland will become an independent country. I don't know. We shall see. Whatever happens, it's going to be important for us to balance pride in our own artistic traditions with curiosity about other cultures. It's going to be important for us to remain relevant, engaged, with all the communities that we serve. Above all, it's important that we encourage people to explore their own sense of identity, to find out what inspires them, what moves them, and what binds and connects them with other people. I think that balancing national interests with international perspective will continue to be a challenge for us, but we will keep searching for that balance, and that's why we have as our vision art for Scotland, inspiration for the world. Thank you very much.